Oh, here we go. <laughs> With all of that, uh, thanks for your contribution. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, it's it's really like a link in a chain. <laughs> <laughs> yes, amen. Uh, it seems that in your in your uh, in your sphere, there's really a lot of hope and a lot of uh, a lot of good, uh, great things to look forward to. I mean, you know, I went to um, I'm from the College Station area, East Texas. Oh yeah. Uh, so Texas A&M has done a really good job of. <laughs> Like carrying the faith. Vocations machine. Yes. Factory. Yes. Yeah. And so that's where I came into the church, St. Thomas Aquinas, and um, and the person that helped, and this isn't about me, but I, I, this is kind of in a similar uh, vein. I was raised up in the faith as a convert around a lot of people that were just on fire. Chris yeah. Bartlett, for, you know, graduated from Steubenville, right. uh, Franciscan, and, uh, and that's the Catholicism I knew. And then I got out into the world and thought, wow, it's not the same everywhere. Mm -hmm. what, what is your thought about the vision of the faith? Where you see things going? Um, I mean, there's gonna be, uh, just because we are mortal men, I mean, there'll be a, a, a change at some point um, in Rome. And then there, you know, what, what is, we're yeah. hopeful. We yeah, see a yeah. lot of great things yeah, happening. Let's... Well, we really don't have an option. You, know, right. you, know, yeah. you can be optimistic or you could be pessimistic. Yeah. Kimberly sure. is optimistic. I mean, our kids sometimes describe her as positive or pathologically positive. She's just <laughs> so optimistic. Whereas dad, he's negative, you know, <laughs> neurotically sometimes, neurotically negative, you know. And so I look out, you know, on this mountain of flowers and I see the weeds, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And, and so my natural, you know, my own natural proclivities lead me to recognize how absolutely necessary the supernatural virtue of hope is mm -hmm. as an infused theological virtue along with faith and love. Uh, so that, you know, the truth is true whether the world accepts it or not. You know, and the truth is going to be always something that points us beyond ourselves in our own natural mm -hmm. habitat. So hope is what will endure the difficulties that we need to clear these hurdles to get all the way home. And love is the, it's really the fuel that, that drives it. And so, you know, hope, once we recognize, is non-optional. Then we also have to be honest and look around and just say, okay, the, the integration of optimism and hope has come apart, you know. Mm -hmm. There really aren't that many natural grounds for being optimistic, even for Kimberly. I mean, Kimberly said something a few years ago that I never thought I'd hear her say. She turned to me one morning and she said, what in the world are we leaving to our kids? Ah, I mean, mm. what is the state of the world that yeah. we're passing on to them? And mm. I'm like, wrong. Huh. We're not passing the world on to mm. them. Mm. The world is just coming. What we're passing mm. on to them is the faith. Yeah. Wow. And that will enable them not only to endure, but also to find joy. You know, that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Mm. And that's what Nehemiah said right after the exile when a few Jews were coming back to rebuild Jerusalem and to restore the temple and that sort of thing. And so that's why, you know, when we were discussing the possibility of getting together down here in Orlando, it just struck me as being appropriate that we would talk about exile. Yeah. You know, yeah. My, yeah. my newest book is Catholics in Exile, mm -hmm. Biblical Wisdom for the Journey Home. But I think exile is what many, if not most, ordinary practicing Catholics yeah, we're feeling it. are feeling. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and whether you're a convert or a cradle Catholic, and actually, I think cradle Catholics are waking up and realizing that we're yeah. called to be converts every bit as much as those who yes. switch tracks, you know. Mm. Yeah. But the, uh, the idea of exile, you know, the theme for this book is simply this, that, you know, people today are alienated from the culture. They, they look at the, the church leadership and they see corruption and they hear the teaching and there's confusion. The politics have sort of spilled into the church worldwide, nationwide, locally. You know, so what do we do in order to not give in to anger, sadness, anxiety, depression? You know, the, th the first thing we have to recognize is that exile is actually the normal state of affairs for the people of God mm. down through the ages. Mm. The majority of history in the Old Testament was not spent, you know, on top of Mount Zion in Jerusalem, <laughs> in the temple. Yeah. I mean, that was a sliver. Yeah. And so they were in Egyptian, bondage for yeah. nearly four centuries. <laughs> They're trying to conquer the promised land, whereas the 
idolatry of the Canaanites is conquering them more often than not. Mm -hmm. Instead of 40 years, it takes practically 400 years to conquer. They keep it, you know, under David and Solomon. They're united for about eh, 73 years. <laughs> and it's like Camelot. Gosh. It's like the golden age, freeze frame. That's normal. Yeah. No, it's <laughs> not. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's a slice of heaven, but that's exactly what God intended it to be. A very temporary, beautiful, meaningful slice of heaven. Yes. Because if we had, you know, if we as pilgrims had come up, you know, uh, Mount Zion, singing the Psalms of Ascent with David himself leading us, and we would have said, you know, is this heaven? No. It's Iowa. You know, the mm -hmm. Field of Dreams thing yeah, again, yeah. you know. David would have turned around and said, no, 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 no. This is Jerusalem, but it's the earthly Jerusalem. This is the man-made temple, you know, and, and so there is only one home, and that is heaven. Our Father who art in heaven, if God is our Father, then we're his family, but if he's in heaven, you know, none of us are home yet. Yeah. And, and that's why I think we recognize that, that God has a purpose for sending his people out of their quote-unquote homeland to give them that sense. You know, in, in the Middle Ages, I found in the Glossa Ordinaria, the medieval study Bible, that as early as Genesis 4 verse 1, when our first parents were driven out of the Garden of Eden and God posts the cherubim with the flaming swords, mm. in the Latin, that situation is described as exile. Mm. Ah. You know, and then as, the you read, as you read St. Bonaventure, you realize that the medievals would go even further, that if they had still been in the Garden of Eden, they probably would have passed a polygraph stating, we're home, mm -hmm. this is our final destination. Mm -hmm. And then they would have heard an angel whisper, no, this is actually the place of probation. You're being tested. The final mm -hmm. destination, your only home, yeah. is something that your eyes can't even picture, you know, your, your, your heart can't even conceive. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, it's never entered the mind of man what God has in store for his people. So it's like exile is sort of like a reality check. And so to have a constructive, hope-filled response to the situation, you know, it might just seem like wild-eyed optimism to say, you know, hope, it's mm. hopeless, mm. Uh, I understand. Mm. You know, but at the same time, we are divided, we are confused, we are surrounded, mm. we are <laughs> infiltrated, mm. you know, so what do we conclude? that according to the wisdom of God, there's never been a better time to be a Catholic. Amen. And that to be a faithful you, Catholic, you, to be a saint. And that everything yeah. is normal. That's right. And everything <laughs> is in control. Yeah. Is in the Lord's control. And mm. again, that sounds like religious rhetoric, you know, Meh. Catholic talking points, pietism. And it's like, if we begin by professing, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, no, this is reality. Yeah. Even if you can't mm. see the sun for weeks because of the storms, you don't stop thinking there's a sun. Absolutely. Doesn't the word par parishioner mean? Uh, yeah, peroikos is actually the word in the Petrine epistles for uh, exile is where we get the word parish and <laughs> parishioner is because, That's you know, even our parish is not, I mean, it's a sacramental home, Yes. you know, but at the same time, it's, it's I, I had a, a student friend of mine say, you know, it's sort of like the kingdom of heaven and across the sea you have the Catholic colonies. And just as you had some rebellious colonies who didn't want to serve the earthly King George, I think we also have Catholics in America today who are more American than Catholic. And yeah. so ah, it's, it's understandable. Oh, that's interesting. Too. Yes, yes. Yeah. As Texans, we understand Texans <laughs> that are more Texans than American. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, you, you did say one thing and about. Rightly so. About <laughs> 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 see, see. <laughs> about um, stars. Your, your son. Uh, um, they're both mission mindset, the, the one who's engaged, yeah. uh, right? And, and Martha has the same mission mindset. Uh, I love that because it reminds me of the book, um, uh, Apostolic from Mission, or from Apostolic yes. Christendom to Apostolic Mission. I was just with Mission. Monsignor Shea. Yeah. Yes, yes. At Seek, two, three weeks ago mm. now. Ah, mm. yes. Yeah, and you know, it's, it's a funny thing because, you know, precisely at the moment where you feel like you've got to circle the wagons and kind of consolidate and isolate and insulate, hmm. I, don't, I can't think of any other words, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, it all just popped in. But you know, the idea is that, oh no, that's precisely when you launch the mission. Yes. You know, that's when God is gonna bless our efforts to reach other people, precisely when we're just so scared. Mm. You know, and it, our two youngest sons are Joe and David. And so um, Joe had already spent a year in Siberia with the Jesuits studying Russian in the Language Institute in Tomsk, which is one of the top Russian language institutes in the world. 
and he walked to the Institute every morning about 15 to 25 minutes, average temperature about 10 below. Yeah. He, wow. he soared, he, 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 I think he, he achieved near fluency in less than a year. He discerned out of the Society of Jesus, <laughs> and we were relieved. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the Russian province is strong, but the Wi-Fi wasn't. <laughs> we could barely get a glimpse of the guy, much less a conversation. Oh, yeah. But when he came out of Siberia, he then spent a year in Austria at the Language and Catechetical Institute with this passion to reach the Eastern European mm. states with the gospel, you know. Mm. And, and, and then after a 30-day retreat, discerned with our diocese and then discerned out, you know. But his, the, the gal he's dating now, he met at the Language and Catechetical Institute. She's a graduate of Franciscan. But they share this, this vision, this passion, this mission mm. sense. Mm. And, and, and David, our youngest, you know, Joe and David in June led, I think, eight graduating high school seniors from Catholic Central High School in Steubenville. They were going through the Camino for three, mm -hmm. three and a half years. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. You know, and sprained ankles, all kinds of things. Yeah, and so sure. the two boys really did get it to the finish line. It was glorious. Mm. And uh, Joe joined us in Slovakia. We were on a week-long mission. And David went over to England where he met Martha in June. Mm. And so uh, the idea to me is this, that you know, we, we didn't do a lot of Bible studies during dinner as mm -hmm. a family growing mm -hmm. up, you know. Mm -hmm. But what we did was to share how much we enjoy being Catholic, mm -hmm. in spite of everything, including ourselves. Yeah. And <laughs> the idea that the joy of the Lord is our strength, Nehemiah 8.10, you know, Philippians, one of the prison epistles, rejoice in the Lord always again as soon as I get out of prison. No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so if we feel trapped, if we feel imprisoned, if we feel embattled and we're on the losing side for now, you know, it's like, well, just rewind to Good Friday and then fast forward to Easter Sunday. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, this is just the way reality works under the Lordship of Christ. I had to tell our oldest, Joan, uh, she's 14, because she was asking questions cause just because, you know, she, she has eyes that can see. And uh, I said, hey, Think about it this way, you were built for such a time as this. Yes. Yeah. And it kind of made her sit back and, mm -hmm. you know, reevaluate her situation to, yeah. to gear up. You know, we're all supposed to be soldiers, not just sitting at a pew. That's yeah. right. You know, we feel like we could justify being discouraged. And our Lord is whispering, I want you to be dangerous mm -hmm. <laughs> in the yeah. kingdom of darkness. You know, yeah. a yeah. childlike soldier who never gets puffed up, you know, it's like Twyla Paris' song, The Warrior is a Child because we are childlike and yet we are to be warlike. We are to be yeah. dangerous, but in a supernatural way. And I'm uh, reading the Narnia series now to my kids. You know, oh, we went there. through that? Right, right, oh, right there. There you go. You know, and my son-in-law who teaches at the university, Ben is something of an expert uh, in literature, but especially Tolkien, the trilogy, mm -hmm. Lord mm -hmm. of the Rings. Mm -hmm. He just did a course for the St. Paul Center on the liturgical imagination of Tolkien. Oh, wow. To show that wow. J.R.R. Tolkien was a convert. Mm -hmm. One of his sons was a priest, but I mean, daily mass. Yeah. And he was a medievalist, and so his whole worldview is imbued in the Lord of the Rings. Sure. Yes. And when you hear Gandalf basically telling Bilbo and the Budge, you know, we don't uh. get to choose the times, you know, <laughs> yes. but we can get through them. Oh, it's so good. It's so good. I'm just reminded we had an interview with uh, Bear Wozniak. Oh. And uh, <laughs> he was talking about, you know, we're talking about being soldiers here and fighting for Christ. You know, he said, you know, gates don't attack. Right. Mm -hmm. The gates of hell will not prevail. We need to be attacking the gate. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Instead of different the mindset. Yeah. 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 Instead yeah. of the opposite. Very, very different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The attack. Yeah. yeah. So what we're doing in this book, uh, Brandon McGinley, a good friend of mine, and I got to co-write this together, along with a book that came out two years before it. The book that came out around 2020, right around the time of the presidential election, was called It Is Right and Just. I think we might have talked about yes. it a little bit mm. before. Why the Future of Civilization Depends Upon True Religion. You know, and a lot of people read it and were sort of uh, surprised and excited. But then when it sinks okay. in, you're like, wow. I mean, our civilization cannot possibly flourish mm -hmm. apart from the Christian faith and the yep. Catholic Church. Yep. But I'm never going to see that. My kids, my grandkids aren't gonna ever see it, you know? Mm, yeah. So we're, we're talking about not just planting the fall crop so you have food in the winter, but planting forests you might not ever get to see mm. so that your grandkids do have the lumber to build their houses or, you know, to have their fireplace in the wintertime and, and whatnot. 
but it became so apparent to us as well that you know we're not going to live to see this so how do we hunker down and how do we really become holy in the midst of what really feels like more than a diaspora more than a dispersion it really does feel like exile and not just externally socially politically culturally but oftentimes internally where you just have fellow catholics you know all, across this wide spectrum of political social moral ethical beliefs i mean i'm glad 30 percent believe in the real presence yeah. But yeah. say what? Seventy yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> percent don't. Mm, I mean yeah. that that isn't like advanced calculus. That isn't yeah. rocket science. Mm. That's not advanced theology. That's like the alphabet of what it means to be Catholic. Mm -hmm. And so we worked on this book for the next two years to really address not just other people we talk to, but especially ourselves as husbands, as fathers, raising families, you know, seeking to really be faithful and fruitful as Catholics. And mm. so we, we, we stumbled across what we ended up calling the Jeremiah option. Mm -hmm. uh, because Jeremiah was there. Oh, for almost 50 years, his ministry uh, begins with Josiah, you know, the greatest king who pulls off the greatest Passover and then died in his prime when he was still young because he just disobeyed orders from God. And so suddenly, Josiah's sons, they're just horrendous. You know, and they fall under Babylon, and the Babylonians come and destroy Jerusalem and the temple, all of the rest. And so it's just like, you know, driving off a cliff. And so Jeremiah sees it all coming. And what's he, what's he encouraging the first waves of exiles as they're being carried off as captives, effectively, mm -hmm. as slaves mm -hmm. to Babylon? You know, he, he writes this letter in Jeremiah 29 where, you know, he, he gives really practical advice that constitutes what we call the Jeremiah option. And so the first thing he says is build houses when you get there. Mm. Mm. So it's not just, you know, tents, it's not just <laughs> running an apartment. No, <laughs> it's not it's it's going to be a Yeah, it's not, you know, <laughs> practice arson until you can really bring the system down, you know. <laughs> um, it's build houses and live in them. And then it's secondly, plant gardens and enjoy the fruit, the produce. Mm. Mm. It's like, well, that means we're going to be here a while. <laughs> yeah, Jeremiah says 70 years, yeah. so, right? Yeah. So that is a while. Okay, so plant houses, uh, build houses, plant gardens. And the third thing is take wives and give them to your sons and, you know, get married, have kids. Mm -hmm. And so numbers three and four are not only get married and have kids, but find spouses for your kids. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, you're really serious. We're going to be here in Babylon for a very long time. And yeah, number five is multiply there. Mm. And don't diminish. Mm. Yeah. And then number six is probably the most shocking thing of all, and that is pray for the peace or the welfare of the city to which the Lord your God has driven you. Whoa. And in the Hebrew, the word is shalom. Like, okay, we can pray for civic stability, you know, the end of violent unrest, but no, pray for shalom. And it's like, okay, the, the Babylonians were our enemies. They destroyed Jerusalem. They desecrated the temple and demolished it. And you want us now to share with them shalom, <laughs> the peace of the covenant? Yeah. yeah. In other words, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. Wait a minute, where have we heard that before? Hmm. The opening chapters yeah, of the Torah. To basics. This yeah. idea of hunkering down and becoming 12 tribes, one nation, let's make Israel great again. You know, our economy <laughs> and all of these things, you know. Right. They might have had, you know, hats with that. <laughs> mega. But, um, mega hats. You know, it, it is so, you know, mega. God said, if you hear my mm. voice and keep my covenant, you'll be a holy nation. All they heard was, we'll be a nation? Mm. Yeah, you'll oh, be a kingdom yeah. of priests? Mm. All they heard There's was, You'll be a kingdom. Uh -huh. And so this idea of a priestly kingdom or a holy nation, yeah, you're going to be a missionary people. You're going to either go out and illuminate the Gentiles with the light of truth, or you're going to go out to the Gentiles and illuminate them as exiles mm -hmm. who finally come back to the light. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you can have it my way or you can have it my way. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The gifts and the calling of God are said to be irrevocable in, in Romans 11.